A common cliche to be found in popular movies is that of the lone genius working on some technological marvel or solving some hitherto unsolved mystery. Tony Stark isolates himself to tinker new technology into existence. Lucius Fox runs the business interests that supply Batman's equipment as well as financing his operations. Emmett L. Brown lives alone and creates a time machine that actually works and a mind-reading device that doesn't. Dr. Egon Spengler designs a man-portable particle accelerator system to capture ghosts. This is a common movie trope, and I guess it reflects that there are indeed some truly inspired people out there in the real world who have some spectacular ideas. However, in truth, for the jobbing innovator to consistently solve really hard problems with really solid ideas day in, day out, the result will most likely require a team effort. To transform problem solving into a reliable, consistent volume consideration, you can't really innovate alone. For me, this team is a necessity. I am a professional rocket scientist and I too have the support of a small team who collaborate every day to solve some really tricky problems. It's important to give the team some credit, but for the sake of anonymity I shall simply call them The Beard and Baby Mama. We each have our own scientific and engineering specialties and together we solve tricky problems. The Beard and Baby Mama also offer ideas for topics to talk about on this channel. I refer you to this handy chart for details of the cut. Don't spend it all at once, chaps, but I digress. So, why the need for this collaboration? Why can't we innovate alone? Well, in the early days of a new problem and immature solutions, you don't really have much science or engineering to offer evidence that an idea may have value. Science and engineering research is expensive. In the early days of an idea, the search for a new customer, problem and solution is a search to determine if an idea is indeed worth expending blood and treasure to research. Prior to entering the lab, what hard evidence do you have that money should be spent? At this stage, all you have is rhetoric and not much more. In the absence of any hard evidence, your argument must be a self-consistent rhetoric which addresses the customer problem without any logical weaknesses. And spotting those logical weaknesses is hard. The solution to this difficulty is where another narrative trope is to be found. Consider Sherlock Holmes. His animated discussions with Watson clearly offer the audience some means to understand the thought processes of Holmes. But there's more truth to this discussion than meets the eye. Consider Dr. Gregory House, a character based very strongly on Holmes. Gregory House leads a team of doctors as the head of diagnostic medicine at the fictional Princeton Plainsborough Teaching Hospital. His relationship with his diagnostic team is rarely amicable. In fact, this relationship is frequently antagonistic, and it seems that this antagonism is a necessary part of the problem-solving process. House needs his team to push back against his more tyrannical behaviors. Now, this might seem a cliche to build drama and offer exposition, but again, there is more utility in this relationship that one might at first think. Me, the beard and baby mama tend to take it in turn to act as protagonist in an innovative exercise. Consider when it's my turn in the hot seat. When I'm on the spot, the beard and baby mama aren't necessarily innovative. Sure, they'll be offering ideas, but when a proposal is pitched, they'll be doing the opposite of innovating. They're trying to kill my argument. They're unnovating. They find holes in my argument, they exploit weak spots in my rhetoric, and do not give in until they are out of options, ever. They will not stop until your idea is dead. And often they will show no mercy. The beard will sink his teeth into an idea and will not let go until he's satisfied. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Baby Mama is often kinder, but makes up for this with a gentle rigor of his own. As for me, I have my own particular strategy. I am usually a massive asshole about the whole thing. If someone will willingly defend an idea whilst I'm being a massive asshole, then I guess it's probably a good idea. And to the outside world and to the uninitiated, this might look like a fully-fledged conflict. But there is a method to this madness. Now, you might think that the beard and baby mama are simply shaking my idea to see if it'll break. And in part they are. But does the discussion need to be so confrontational? Well. Yes, I think so, but there's a bigger prize to play for here. We're not just testing an idea, we're trying to find a better one. In this confrontation, we seek to ignite the innovative spark itself. Consider the alternative. 
comfortable bean bags, bright colors, and a human resources department that will come down on you like a ton of fucking bricks should anyone be made to feel uncomfortable. And rightly so, in most cases. I don't think anyone uninitiated into our little cabal should be made to suffer some of our more intense discussions and our more eccentric methods. To be on the receiving end of this takes some trust that it's the argument, not the arguer, that is under scrutiny. We're still friends, right? This can be tricky. With a little trust and a little hard work, this approach can bear some significant fruit. In problem solving, we have a concept commonly referred to as psychological inertia. It's the brain's version of that cliche, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Bill Gates is often credited with the quote, I will always choose a lazy person to do a difficult job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. Humanity has perhaps prevailed against a cruel and unforgiving universe by being lazy. We've been finding the easiest and most energy efficient solution to the difficult problem of survival for millennia. Keep taking the energy efficient approach and we can probably keep going into the far future. The mind is no different. When faced with a tricky problem, the mind will be lazy. When faced with a problem and little real evidence to go on, your mind will tread familiar paths to exploit known quantities and familiar strategies to solve the problem. To illustrate, here's an example of the psychological inertia that I face every day working in a secure environment. The security in my lab is tight. Every door is open with a pass card. Swipe the card and the door opens. Where is the card reader usually placed? Typically, it's too low to conveniently reach from the lanyard around one's neck. And it's also inconveniently high to keep the card in one's pocket and bump the door open with your ass. After all, if one is carrying a couple of cups of coffee, it would be very convenient to bump the card reader with your ass and unlock the door. But the reader is always to be found at the most inconvenient height, neither low enough nor high enough. Why? Why is this the case? I have a theory. I think psychological inertia is at play. After all, this is a lock that secures a door. In the days before electronic locks, the door was secured by mechanical means. Consequently, the locking mechanism had to be co-located with the bolt that secures it closed. Typically the bolt, and therefore the mechanical keyhole, will be about halfway up the door. When an electronic lock was introduced, a decision had to be made. Where should the card reader be placed? The card reader is an electronic keyhole. Psychological inertia will place the lock where the mechanical keyhole is usually to be found, about halfway up the door. Too low for a lanyard, too high for a pocket. The card reader is placed in an inconvenient position because that's where keyholes are always placed. An electronic keyhole need not be placed at this height at all. It can be anywhere, but it's not psychological inertia in action. Personally, when carrying two cups of coffee, I think that the best place for the card reader might be on the floor. If I slipped my pass into the sole of my shoe, I'd never have to think about it. So how do we break psychological inertia? Consider Miller's 300. It offers a dramatic illustration of a solution. In this narrative, the Spartan children are shown to train hard in the formal forms and functions of that most ancient of problem-solving frameworks, martial arts. One might imagine that this training is sufficient. However, in this narrative, they are shown to throw children out into the snow to survive. And then necessity truly becomes the mother of invention. Consider the Martian at the other end of history. Mark Watney's predicament does not merely demand that he exercise a well-understood procedure to survive. This narrative is exciting because this botanist has to science the shit out of his predicament. He has to find innovative solutions to tricky problems that have never before been encountered. And to achieve this, he must break out of his psychological inertia. Watney doesn't just become a disruptive innovator, he becomes a space pilot. And we human spectators find this exciting. We're built for this sort of thing. Humanity has been solving problems for thousands of years, and the breaking of psychological inertia under stress has become a particular skill. But Watney is alone, and his predicament is forced upon him by the environment. This triggers his isolated intellect. In the everyday of engineering design, ideas don't form inside the human mind. I've never seen a truly inspired idea form this way, as psychological inertia will often lull the mind into lazy, low-energy thinking. Now, I'm not talking about creativity here. I'm not referring to idle daydreaming. Sure, the solitary mind can do that all day. The inspiration I'm talking about is the ability to form a watertight argument. No holes, no weak joints, no leaks. 
a solid argument that will stay afloat and weather the worst of storms. In my experience, really great ideas form in the spaces between people. They whiz and pop between collaborators, settling for a moment in one mind before leaping to the next intellect. The majority of the time, this inspiration is not attempting to determine what the solution might be. For the most part, it leaps between hosts, attempting to understand what the solution is definitely not. It's creating boundaries, the space between which the true solution might be found. All the while, the beard and baby mama crush my ideas with truth and I'm backed further and further into a corner and eventually as they poke and prod and query and criticize my potential solution space will shrink and shrink and shrink to zero. I'll have nowhere left to retreat. And in my determination to defend my corner, whilst the beard and baby mama press onwards, when the psychological inertia is pressed to its peak, this is when the magic happens. Because if you corner a human, they will do everything they can to escape, and humans have all the intellectual tools that they need to do so. We have evolved this way. We have been dreaming up inventive solutions to life-threatening problems for millennia, and we've become very good at it. So once me or the beard or baby mama are cornered, we'll fight our way out. This is when we'll be forced to unburden ourselves from our inertia and truly innovate our way out of the situation. You can't innovate alone because we need that confrontation and that pressure to spark our innovation into action. This well-mannered confrontation creates the conditions required to break us from our lazy psychological inertia. And humanity have not only become very good at breaking these bonds, we love to watch. This confrontational problem solving is an enduring space that will draw crowds. You can't innovate alone. The mind needs a sparring partner, and this sparring can become the basis for many, many intriguing narratives. And if these collaborators stop challenging one another, then the music stops. Now we simply have an unchallenged authority waxing lyrical whilst we merely spectate. And this is boring.